It's the Sunrise Morning Show. I'm Anna Mitchell, joined by Jeff Cavins, and he's got a new book out from Servant Books called When You Suffer, Biblical Keys for Hope and Understanding. Jeff, good morning. Good morning. Good to be with you, Anna. Why did you feel the need to write a book about suffering? Well, because I was suffering. (laughs) And the actual truth of the matter is that's right. Uh, You know, over the years... Uh, in teaching Bible, I started to become aware that there are certain topics in the Bible that, that people want answers Mm -hmm. for, but they don't have them. And one of them is the meaning of suffering Mm -hmm. in their life. And the, everybody's going to suffer. The question isn't if you're going to suffer, it's when and more to the point, how are you going to suffer? And so suffering is one of those, those topics that everybody is dealing with, whether it's in their, their family, marriage, their health, uh, finances, their emotional well-being, and simple little answers don't cut it. Right. People want to know, in the end, is there any meaning to this? Is this a waste in my life? And if Jesus suffered for me, then, then why in the world do, do I have to suffer? So it really caught my attention about 12 years ago when I had a very serious neck injury and my C6-7 in my spine actually broke. It split. Mm. And I went through nine months of just just agony in in pain and during that time my good friend Scott Hahn and I we we would talk almost daily on the phone about suffering uh, you know and I was very familiar with that phrase offer it up my mother would say you know I was growing up offer it up and that basically meant get out of the kitchen I'm cooking you know <laughs> but I but I knew that phrase but to be honest with you Anna I didn't know theologically, really the inner workings of why that works, why we should do it. And so I had been studying this for over a decade, mm-hmm. and I finally decided that it's time for me to to really write a book that is both theological and incredibly practical. Well, how does it feel as somebody who studies the history of salvation for a living, who teaches the history of salvation for a living, How do you feel knowing that you can actually participate in salvation through your suffering? Well, it's very, it's very powerful to, to suddenly realize that all of the work that Jesus did for us is for us, but that all of the work that he did for us, he invites us to participate with him. And this is one of the differences between Catholic theology and the early church and the modern American notion of Christianity, Mm -hmm. where Jesus did it all, and I just receive, 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 and receive, and I'm a king's kid, and I don't have to suffer. And we've heard that type of gospel on television. Problem with that is that it's, number one, not biblical. Number two, it's not reasonable. And number three, I would say it's incredible incredibly American. Look, there's two ways of looking at this. One is that Jesus did everything, and all I have to do now is receive the good stuff. I have allocated Jesus to the tougher job of Mm -hmm. the cross and suffering, and I just take all the goods. The problem with that, as I said, is it's not biblical. The second perspective is, yes, he did everything, but now as sons and daughters, he invites us to participate in his mission So, for example, Jesus is the one intercessor between God and men. We know that. That's what uh, is written in the New Testament. Yet he shares his intercessory role with us when he says, pray for one another. He is the good shepherd, yet he shares that shepherding role with pastors, with the priests that we have. He is the judge. But he clearly says that one day we will be judging with him. He's the healer, yet he says, lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So he's sharing everything about his mission with us, and suffering isn't any different. So he suffered for the sins of the world, yet Paul says in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 24, I rejoice in my suffering for your sake, and I complete in my body that which is lacking in the sufferings Mm -hmm. of Christ. So what could be lacking in the sufferings of Christ? Well, nothing except our participation. We have been given a small particle of the infinite treasury of God's redemptive suffering. We've been given a little particle, and St. John Paul II says we can apply that to people, and then we find that our suffering joined to Christ becomes salvific, it's redemptive, And we participate with him in redeeming the world. We participate with him, Anna, in this loving of the world. So, you know, the bottom line is that suffering gives us the opportunity to love 
as Christ loves and to experience the exchanges of love in the Trinity. It's an amazing opportunity, but one that's often wasted. Yeah, and you know, I mean this wholeheartedly, that the Catholic Church's teaching on suffering is my favorite part of being Catholic, other than the Eucharist, which is you and I are you and I are totally together there. And yet we look at the world and the presence of suffering in our world is what so many people cite for why they don't believe in God. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question. And it's kind of the it's kind of the 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 other side of the coin, you know, that if, if suffering joined with Christ is so valuable it's heavenly cash, if you will, Mm -hmm. it's so valuable, then why is there so much suffering in the world? And what is our role as a church to relieve suffering? If it's so good, why relieve it? You know, and this is the, the two sides of that, of the same coin. Yes, we do participate with Christ. Christ did suffer for the world. He suffered for the world, not that the world would continue to suffer forever, but that we would have our sins dealt with through his suffering. Our suffering can mean something joined to him in terms of relieving the suffering of of the world. St. John Paul II said it so well. He said, there's two kinds of suffering. There is physical suffering and there is moral suffering, the suffering of the heart. That's Mm -hmm. two types. There's also two kinds. There's, There's temporal suffering and what he calls definitive suffering, which is to be without God forever and ever and ever. So what Jesus did is he utilized physical and moral suffering in the temporal time period here to deal with that definitive suffering. We're not meant to suffer forever. We're not meant to live with our our bodies falling apart forever. Jesus came to address definitive suffering. And this question that you bring up of, if God loved us so much, why is there so much suffering in the world? That isn't because of God. That is because of original sin. Mm -hmm. That's because of what happened with our, our original parents, Adam and Eve. It is unfortunate that there's that much suffering in the world, but it it means that we as Catholics should double our efforts to pray for people, to bring relief to the suffering in the world, and to not waste our own suffering, but to love as Christ loved, to pick up our cross daily and follow him. Jeff, let's get practical today. You said there was practicality in your book. So what are some practical ways to deal with your suffering? Well, I think that one of the things that we can do with our suffering, first of all, when we offer it up, it's not uh, magic. It's not just saying, I offer it up. <laughs> it's really uh, it's really embracing and utilizing your will. And what you're doing is you're doing the same thing that Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane. He went into the Garden of Gethsemane and he said, Father, if there's another way, Let's do it. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And so the human will of Jesus was always in lockstep with the divine will of his father. And what what we have to do in our own suffering is not waste it, but to see it as an opportunity to love and participate in the redeeming of the world. And so often we run from our suffering. We hide from it. Now, I'm not saying you can't take in a leave or Advil or anything else. That's silly. But we oftentimes when we suffer, we end up self-medicating, mm-hmm. running. We blame other people. And it's it's time for us as Christians to grow up, to pick up our cross, and in a practical way say, I am going to join my suffering with the suffering of Christ. And when you do that, Anna, when you say, I offer up my suffering in union with Christ, Something happens to your suffering. St. John Paul II said, even your suffering is redeemed. He makes all things new. And Jesus is not in the market of wasting his time on things that are meaningless. And so your suffering is not meaningless. It has meaning. And all you have to do is, is act on your will and say, I am, I'm offering this up in union with Christ for my daughter, for the Holy Father, for the police officers around the country, whatever it might be, I am, I'm going to, I'm going to use this. But with, you know, when we think about suffering, oftentimes we think about the big ticket items, cancer, car accidents, uh, strokes and things like that. 
But in the book, one of the things that I'm really going after is what I would call your less than ideal day. Because that's where the battle is won. Most people have this idea of what their ideal life is. It's comfortable, predictable, they're gifted at it, they're affirmed, all their needs are met. Everybody likes their ideal day. The problem with your ideal day is that you've got to wake up in the morning to real life. And real life smacks your ideal life right in the face. And it's not comfortable. Your needs are not met. It's not your your your, your strength. You're not being affirmed. And when real life hits your ideal life, sometimes what we do is we blame other people. We run. We self-medicate. And here's the sad thing is that as a result of not knowing what to do with your less than ideal life, we end up living only about 30 or 40 percent of our life. And what do we do for the other 60? We just put up with life. And in the book, what I'm I'm saying is you don't need to just put up with life. You can embrace all of your life because you've got something to do with your less than ideal day now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, we're continuing our discussion here on the Sunrise Morning Show with Jeff Cavins. He is the author of When You Suffer, Biblical Keys for Hope and Understanding, a new book out through Servant Books. Jeff, you know, you talk about these these little things, and I have been learning this as I go as a new mother and dealing with little things like she won't take a nap when (laughs) I want her to take a nap, and she gets very cranky, and I have to deal with that. I find these little opportunities to offer it up. And in addition to, you know, knowing that, yeah, these aren't super significant sufferings compared to what other people are doing. What I feel like I'm doing is is building up the strength for when what I think will probably be inevitable, a big moment of suffering will come along. Right. Well, you, you bring up a good point. The, the, the battle, the big battles that we are going to all face, you know, and maybe it's old age, maybe it, maybe something happens in the family, mm-hmm. uh, and, uh, that's life. You know, things do happen in life. The key to dealing with those big ticket items is being able to handle the small things. And if, if something, you know, God forbid, uh, catastrophic happened in your family a year from now, mm-hmm. you would look at your daughter crying as being a very insignificant incident in your life. But if you can take those, as I say it in the book, um, the less than ideal days, mm-hmm. and you can learn to start to, to love in that situation, then you will practice dying to yourself so that when the big-ticket item may come, you're ready for it. Archbishop Fulton Sheen put it really well, and I I quote this in the book. He said, one of the, you know, the the biggest fear that we have in suffering is death. Mm -hmm. That's what we're really afraid of, is death. You know, I lost my job, so what? I could die, you know? Right. Um, That's what we're afraid of. And he he said something very important. He said, he said, one of the reasons that we so fear death is that we don't practice for it. In other words, in America, we go all of our life preserving our life, building up our little empires, uh, taking, doing everything we can avoid to, to avo- or everything we can do to avoid suffering. And so when finally that big ticket item comes, we don't know how to deal with it. And he said this. He said, what we need to do is we need to start practicing dying. And how do you, how do you do that? You mortify the flesh. You pick up your cross. You deny yourself. And when your little daughter, your little son is crying, you deny yourself. You pick up your cross and you offer this up in love with the love of Christ. And the more you do that, the more you practice that when that day comes, you know, as I said in the book, you could say, been there, done that many, many times. What is your message, Jeff, for somebody listening right now who might be in that big ticket item moment of suffering in their lives, maybe never had the opportunity to know how to build up this strength through offering up the little sufferings and just feel despair. Sure. Well, despair is is an enemy. You know, despair is 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 a reality for a lot of people. In the book, I mentioned that um, if you cannot attach meaning to your suffering, you can go into despair. But if you can attach meaning to your suffering, you can go through anything. Mm -hmm. So I could say to you, Anna, would you be willing to suffer for a month 
some pretty excruciating pain for a mouse. No. All right. That didn't take you very long to come up with that answer. <laughs> that, but you, you mentioned that you've got a, a beautiful brand new baby. Mm-hmm. Would you be willing to suffer for a month for your new baby? I'd be willing to suffer a lifetime. Would you? Well, suddenly we found meaning. Mm-hmm. So if, if you're in that situation right now, as you mentioned, the, one of the first things you need to do is find meaning in it. And mm-hmm. it's in the, the way that we understand the meaning of suffering is we understand Christ's suffering for us and that it was an expression of love. It is um, uh, an act of the will, but it is, it is a, an expression of love. And so, there, number one, there is meaning in your suffering. You're in the hospital, wherever you're at, wherever you're listening you know, to this show, there is meaning in Christ for your suffering. And it's, it's finding that meaning and walking in his love that you find this relief for your soul. I'll give you, give you an example. Do you have time for an example? Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. I was, um, when I was going through my neck problem, I, I, I got to be honest with you, I, I'm not a good sufferer. And, Who is really? Well, I don't think men are actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're big babies. Men are babies, and you know, men get the men. Their back hurts, and oh, they're sitting there, lazy boy. You know, mm-hmm. honey, grab me the remote. Kids, grab me my beer. You know, I just that's the way they are so often. But I, I, one night, I, I just had it because physical suffering over a long period of time wears you out emotionally, and um, it causes strong men to become weak men. <laughs> mm-hmm. But you know what? When we are weak. In Christ, we can become very strong. And so one night, I went downstairs prior to my surgery uh, on my neck, and I just couldn't sleep. And I I was just in agony, and I sat down on the couch, and I started crying. And I said, and and I was doing the, uh, I was doing Life on the Rock at the time, Hmm. and flying back and forth, you know, to do the show, and my arm was just killing me. And I just said, God, I started crying. I said, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do anymore. I, just, I can't live like this. I can't live like this. What do I do? How do I offer it up? How do I do it? And then suddenly this like epiphany came. And uh, as I mentioned in the book, a shoe company ended up taking this little phrase and running with it, made a lot of money. But the answer was, just do it. Mm-hmm. Just do it. And so I went upstairs to my daughter's room, and the two little girls were sleeping in their room, and they never wake up. So I didn't mm-hmm. have to worry about that. I knelt down next to my middle daughter, the Jackie. She was sleeping. She was about five. And I put my head down the pillow and I just said, Jesus, I offer up this suffering for her. Mm. And I started just weeping. And I just said, for her, for her, I offer this up for her. And I just cried. And she didn't wake up. My head was right there on the pillow with her. And I'm just crying. I said, for her. And something, Anna, something rose up in my heart at that point. And I realized that for the first time in my life as a father, I was loving my daughter the way Christ loved me Hmm. for Jeff on the cross. And I'll tell you what, it still hurt. It still hurt. But a tremendous joy rose up in my heart in the midst of it. And this is what... St. John Paul II talks about when he says, you cannot teach suffering in the objective. You can't just do a course on it and people go, oh, okay, I get it. He says, it's a vocation. Come follow me. Come follow Christ. And it's in the following of Christ and picking up your cross that you go, ah, now I get it. Now I know what it means to love, to offer up my life for somebody else. And that's the beauty of it. And frankly, that's why people that are just running around in the average parish don't say, oh, Lord, send me the suffering. I'll gladly take it. But if you read the lives of the saints, like St. Therese of Lisieux and others, Mm -hmm. you constantly hear them say, Lord, you love me so much that you gave me the opportunity to love like you. You know, I was going to end the interview right there, but you made me think of a saint I have such a devotion to her, Chiara Luce Badano. She was 18 years old when she died of bone marrow cancer, and or maybe she was 17. She was a teenager, and that is considered one of the more painful forms of cancer that you can have. And the Focolare movement uh, has quotes from her from her time in the hospital, and she refused morphine one because she didn't like that it that she wasn't lucid anymore. And two, because she said, my suffering is all I have left to give to Jesus. Wow. Beautiful. 
Mother Angelica said something like that, something similar to that to me one time mm-hmm. when, when she was healed of her back, back injuries. Mm-hmm. And she took the braces off and she had called me the next morning and asked me to come down to the parlor. And I, I came down and that night she went on Life on the Rock and she wanted to dance with me in front of the America, America Live. First of all, I don't dance a lot, and I don't dance with nuns on television. You don't dance with nuns. So, but I ended up dancing that night. But about five months later, she, she, we were talking at lunch, and she said, "You know, I kind of miss the suffering because it was wow. so much to give him." Wow, I think that's a great place to end that uh, series with Jeff Cavins. You can find his book through Servant Books. When We Suffer, Biblical Keys for Hope and Understanding. I hope you've enjoyed that three-part interview as much as I enjoyed speaking with him. Just beautiful words uh, and a beautiful message that we need to remember, that our suffering really can mean something and our suffering really can be beautiful.